One of the things that Mother Teresa was very keen on was to pray for priests and to pray for seminarians. That same concern that she had for the sisters in the United States, that concern she had for priests and seminarians, that they be truly good and holy men of God. And so I asked some of the seminarians with whom I live if they would like to come today, and the three who volunteered to come, I'd like just to introduce them to you. This is Jordan Develus. He's from the Diocese of Metuchen. And he just started in September. So in the seminary, he's just learning how to walk. All right, so like a propedeutic year is the word. It's the beginning year where he's learning many things about the life of the seminary and the life of the priest. The other two seminarians, Stephen, Dalia, and Matt Pearson are seniors. Stephen is from Patterson Diocese, and Matthew is from Madison, Wisconsin. And they're both going to Rome to study next year. Uh, why? I don't know. <laughs> Their bishops decided that they would send them to Rome. No, I know why. They're very good students, and they are good seminarians. But what I want to say to them today in front of you is that in Rome they should help, they should become volunteers of the Missionaries of Charity. What do you think, Sister Minorma? You think? So all they have to do is walk down the hill from where they live at the North American College, and there is the, what is that, the gift of Mary? The Dono di Maria, the gift of Mary. And that's a soup kitchen, so you could go there every day, once a week, to volunteer with the sisters. And then there are many other houses of the missionaries of charity around Rome. So I want them to do that so that Rome doesn't go to their heads, <laughs> that they don't get big heads, that they're living with the Holy Father. So the sisters will keep them working with their hands dirty, right? And with their feet on the ground. So try your best, Matthew and Stephen, in Rome to be volunteers for the missionaries of charity. And if you do that, then the sisters will keep you busy for the rest of your life as a priest, <laughs> right? I used to be in Fairfield, New Jersey. You know where Fairfield is, right? And the sisters in the South Bronx would call me 10 o'clock at night sometimes. I thought missionaries of charity were in bed for at least an hour by then. But they would call at 10 o'clock and they would say, Father, you will say mass tomorrow at seven o'clock? In Indian, I don't think there's a question mark. There's not an interrog interrogative voice. So they don't know how to say, will you? No, you will say mass tomorrow at seven o'clock. And one day, it took me a long time, but I learned how to say no. I said, sisters, I'm going to drive past about 75 churches on my way to the South Bronx. And if you go out your door and turn right, there's a parish church right there. But Whenever I could, I would help the sisters. And um, God bless them. They want mass in the house every day, and they know how to twist people's arms to get that done. <laughs> right? In any event, I want to just say a few words to conclude what I said earlier this morning about this passion of Jesus. Just in a nutshell, what I wanted to say, and I hope that I communicated it, was that there were levels of suffering that Jesus experienced on Calvary for love of us. First, there was a terrible physical pain of the crucifixion, and we can't even imagine the torment, that torture that that was. But then there was the deeper mental pain that Jesus experienced as a result of seeing and somehow being drawn into every human person's sinfulness and need for God. What I probably didn't say and I should have said is that Jesus not only felt the pain and the alienation of the sinner, but also the pain and the hurt of those people who are sinned against and who experience terrible injustice in their life, terrible poverty at many different levels of poverty. So Jesus, he was the poor, no one was as poor as Jesus on the cross. He was the poorest of the poor. 
But the deepest suffering of Jesus was that he was on fire with love. St. John Paul II says in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit descended upon the crucified Christ and ignited him with such love for the Father, such a desire to give glory to the Father, and such a desire to unite all men and women in him, that he was a holocaust of love, that he died of love for his Father and for love of us. Now, what I want to say this, at this Holy Mass is that as Mary stood with Jesus on Calvary, as far as she was able, she alone understood that he was suffering far deeper than the physical pain of his crucifixion. She understood somehow that he was related to all of us, that she, he saw all of us and loved us and was thirsting for our salvation, thirsting that we be with him forever in his kingdom of heaven. And she also understood that he was dying of love, that he was on fire with love. St. John Paul II has wonderful insight into Mary's suffering on Calvary. He tells us that she suffered what a mother would suffer seeing her only son tortured in such a horrible way. But she was also asked to participate in his suffering by continuing to believe what God had said to her 33 years before through the Annunciation. What did God tell her about the son she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit? God said these words to her through Gabriel. He will be great, the son of the most high God. He will reign forever over the house of Jacob and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary standing at the foot of the cross was asked by God to continue to believe that promise that God had made to her. Think of it. She's seeing him in torture, crucified. He will be great, the son of the most high God. He will reign forever over the house of Jacob. In other words, he'll be the Messiah king forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. How does that make sense? Looking at a crucified man. St. John Paul II said, Mary filled with faith and trust in God and love said, I believe what, those, what God meant when he spoke those words to me, even though I don't understand their fulfillment. She made the perfect act of love, for perfect act of faith in the word of God. She believed, she trusted that God would not betray her, And sometimes that's our greatest problem, isn't it? We don't trust God. He's taken care of us for 50, 60, 70 years, and we still don't think he's going to take care of us today or tomorrow. Mary trusted the father of Jesus, and she trusted that he would not tell her a lie. And she entered, as she was able, into his love for us. And then... Jesus speaks to her, hardly able to speak. He says to her, woman, he calls her Eve. He's the new Adam, bringing life where Adam brought death. She's Eve, believing where, Adam, where Eve did not believe, trusting where Eve did not trust God. Woman, and he looks at his beloved disciple, John, and he says, woman, this is your son. And then he says to the disciple, he, St. John doesn't give us his name. He calls himself the beloved disciple because he represents me and you. Woman, this is your son. To John, this is your mother. And then 
St. John ends that beautiful exchange by saying, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. That's how it's translated in the scripture. But in Greek, it says something a little different. It says, because of that hour, the hour of Jesus's glorification on the cross, because of that hour, the disciple took her into his own, own, O-W-N. In other words, the disciple took Mary as his possession, his treasure. And he entrusted to her everything that he had and everything that he was. That's the devotion to Mary that we have to have, each of us. We receive from the crucified Christ the gift of his mother to be our mother. And Jesus says, take her into your home, take her into your intimacy, into your own. And then shortly after that, Jesus dies. And then something happens, which is a suffering that is uniquely Mary's. To make sure that Jesus is dead, the Roman centurion who's keeping guard over the execution takes his spear and thrusts it into the side of Jesus. And St. John writes that when the heart of Jesus was struck, blood and water flowed out. The blood and the water that remained in his body poured out of his side. Jesus didn't feel that pain. He was dead. That was pain uniquely felt by our Blessed Mother. I was talking once to a woman, I had preached on this gospel, and she came to me and she said, Father, when I was a young mother, I lost my second child. The child died, crib death. And that was a terrible experience to lose a child. But she said the doctors said that there had to be an autopsy. And she said the thought that the child's flesh was cut open drove me mad with grief. And she said that helped me to understand what Mary felt as she saw the side of Christ pierced and his heart pierced by a centurion's lance. A theologian of the 20th century said that that wounding of the heart of Jesus opened the space in Mary's heart for sinners. The wound was felt by Mary, not Jesus, and it made her the refuge of sinners. Now I'm certain that each of us has members of the family, friends who are far away as far as we're able to judge that from God. As we continue with this Holy Mass today, let's entrust those people to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, praying that they find refuge in her heart and a way back to Jesus. Pray especially today for the Christians in China who are experiencing persecution. Pray for them. Pray for Christians anywhere in the world where there is persecution. Pray for the members of your family, your loved ones and friends who need to come through the heart of Mary to the sacred heart of the Lord. You know, Mother Teresa, could not say Immaculate Heart of Mary, period. She couldn't say Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Every time she 
thought of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, she added to it cause of our joy. Immaculate Heart of Mary, cause of our joy. Pray for us. Let's realize that because of Mary's yes to the Annunciation, because of her yes on Calvary, because she said yes to us becoming her children, she became our mother. And the cause of our joy, the cause of our eternal life. Immaculate Heart of Mary, joy, pray for us. Let us place our petitions before our Heavenly Father. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop Joseph, and all the Catholic bishops throughout the world, that they may reflect in the world the image of Christ crucified and risen, we pray to the Lord. For all Catholic Christians throughout the world, that they conform themselves to the death and the resurrection of Jesus through the sacrament of penance this Lent, we pray to the Lord. For Saint, the community of the missionaries of charity at St. Augustine's and throughout the world, that they may be living images of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, cause of our joy, let us pray to the Lord. For all the poor people they serve here and throughout the world, that they may be comforted by the merciful heart of Jesus, we pray to the Lord. And for the three seminaries of our archdiocese, that they be places of holiness, where Jesus is known and loved and served, we pray to the Lord. And all the faithful departed, especially the deceased sisters, of the Congregation of the Missionaries of Charity, we pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, through your passion and death, bring us to the joy of Easter Sunday. You are Lord forever and ever. Amen.